Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to Rick and I for the last 10 minutes. Um, we're going to get started so that you guys can um, we can start the presentation. Um, as I just said and as you just heard, um, we are recording this presentation, and I will be sending out um, the slides within the next couple days. Um, so if you've registered, you can, you can expect that in your inbox. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Nicole Desiato. I am the Customer Relations and Events Coordinator for Bedford Group North Publishing Group. I have been so lucky to plan this um, week-long <laughs> event. This is actually the fifth webinar I've done in the last week. Um, and all of them are about current events. The rest were focused more around the election. And for environmental science, we decided to go um, a little bit of a different route, but this is still a topic that you can use with your students. Um, so it kind of pulls into our current events theme. Um, if you have any questions, you can send a chat to me, the host, um, by selecting either my name or just sending it to the host, and I'll get back to you through there. Um, we have muted everybody just to cut down on the background noise. Um, yeah, I will be taking all questions at the end, so feel free to send them to me throughout the presentation, and then I'll just keep track, and um, we can do Q&A after Rick's presentation. So um, if you guys need anything at all, I'm right on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, great to have so many of you with me. Uh, this evening to talk about um, environmental risk, human impacts, and in particular, uh, the Flint, Michigan water crisis. And I'll preface this with, I certainly don't know everything about this crisis, but um, I do think it's, it's a really good teaching moment uh, to uh, show an example of environmental science with something that's in the news and something that, uh, as you'll see, uh, we can even show your students real data that they can work with uh, from the Flint water crisis. So uh, what I thought I'd do is, is go and give a little background first about me. If you've never been to a webinar with me before, um, I am coming to you from upstate New York, uh, where I uh, currently am a professor. We'll talk about that in a moment. So I grew up in upstate New York as well. So I've actually come back home after lots and lots of years of being away, spending lots of time outside, and, and started my education out at the uh, State University of New York at, at uh, Syracuse. Uh, spending lots of time running around the Adirondacks as an undergraduate, and uh, studying lots and lots of different kinds of birds, mostly uh, at that stage. And then I moved on to Texas Tech University for a master's degree, spending my time uh, studying mule deer in West Texas and wildlife management. Um, and then uh, moving on for my PhD at the University of Michigan, very different world, uh, studying aquatic ecosystems, so studying ponds and wetlands and lakes and uh, working with a whole diverse team of folks uh, at the University of Michigan. And right after that, I went to the University of Pittsburgh to be a professor back in 1999. Um, I was there for about 15 years studying a lot of things, including things like ecotoxicology, that is, trying to understand what things like pesticides are doing to aquatic organisms, to aquatic ecosystems. And uh, so that's one of my uh, expertise is in sort of the area of ecology and toxicology, and that's uh, what I teach. It's also what I still do uh, research on today. And uh, in that time, lots of fun discoveries, and you'll see some of them here, uh, uh, raising some questions about the way the EPA currently tests pesticides and uh, the way the things like can be harmed by pesticides that uh, were possible before. So lots and lots of uh, popular press on, on that sort of thing. A tremendous research group, and I show this picture because uh, any any year I show this picture, you'll see a couple of high school teachers, and there's two of them here, the gentleman in blue and the woman in the white shirt over a white T-shirt. That's uh, Chris Chapman and, and uh, uh, Cindy as well, and they're both high school teachers, and, and there's actually a picture of, of uh, Chris Chapman in his high school. We have spent a, a great deal of time working with teachers, having them work in our research lab for the whole summer, uh, publishing papers with us. And then we go into their classrooms and spend time with their students trying to get a better sense of uh, how we can be helpful in bringing environmental science uh, into these classrooms. And this is all in Western Pennsylvania, uh, where we spend our time. Um, about two years ago, I was asked to come over to Rensselaer, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, better known as RPI, 
here in western or eastern New York. And uh, one of the great things when I got here was my wife and I were able to find this really interesting uh, passive solar and active solar house. So, you know, we don't just talk about environmental science. We try to, you know, walk the walk and, and, and uh, embrace that as much as we can. Uh, not only in my personal life, but in the professional life, uh, I was hired by Rensselaer to come and do a, a really fun project on a place called Lake George, New York, partnering with IBM and uh, a conservation group called the Fund for Lake George to understand human impacts on large lakes. So this, if you don't know, is about 30 miles long and about 200 feet deep. And we have lots of really interesting uh, environmental sensors that go on this work. And we call this the Jefferson Project because Thomas Jefferson once came to this lake and said it was the most beautiful body of water he'd ever seen in the US. Uh, and we have lots of us uh, working on that to understand uh, how you uh, use modern environmental sensors to uh, figure out how lakes uh, behave and what the human impacts are. And as you say here, everything we do is in this lake, but it's really generalizable to uh, the human impacts on lakes around the world. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, what we're uh, looking at today is uh, here's just a brief outline. We want to talk briefly about the importance of water around the world. Uh, then we'll segue into the Flint water crisis. And then we'll talk just a bit about some additional information that you can find um, in our uh, either the first or second edition of the uh, Friedman and Raleigh Environmental Science book uh, for more information on, on a lot of these topics. So let's talk about the first one, just the importance in general of water around the world, because uh, some people know this and some people have a good appreciation, others have less of an appreciation, but I always like to sort of communicate that, that fresh water, not just water, but fresh water is really this critical resource because it's really rare. As you may know, most of the water we have is in the oceans. Fresh water is about 3% of all water. And most of that is not available. Most of it's frozen or below ground. So it's a really tiny fraction of water, less than 1%, that's actually accessible to us. That is through uh, wells and that sort of thing. So it's a really tiny amount of water. And as you may appreciate, a lot of the world uses water faster than it is replaced. Um, we see that in California for the last four years until El Nino came this year and, and really gave them lots of, of uh, water, almost too much. We saw it in Texas a couple years ago. But in different parts of the world, they frequently use water um, uh, at a higher rate than it can be replaced in the aquifers. And that, of course, causes all this competition for water. And it's interesting because part of this is some of the issues that happened in Flint in terms of having this, this competition over the cost of water. Um, so that brings us to the Flint water crisis. And I'm, I'm going to imagine that most of you have heard bits and pieces of this, as many of us did. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how this unfolded, because I think this is a great teaching moment for students to understand why they should care about environmental science, why they should care about human health and environmental risk. Um, it's a great segue into these kind of topics uh, that your students can probably uh, understand quite well. So what we have to do first, I think, is understand why we're talking about lead and lead pipes. And uh, what's interesting about the, the use of lead pipes is uh, quite a while ago, lead pipes were really preferred to iron pipes. So late 1800s and early 1900s, they were preferred because they'd last longer, they wouldn't rust out like, a, like iron pipes but also they were easier to bend because lead is a fairly soft material, so it's easy to bend. But, um, you know, there, there have been some problems, and those problems are recognized. Uh, some of the first medical reports go back to the 1860s that people were concerned about people getting poisoned by lead. We know much, much more about that now, but there are some concerns even back then. By the 1920s, some of the cities around the U.S. were either banning lead pipes or restricting the use of them. Um, and around the 1920s, the lead industry, the lead mining industry, um, really pushed to promote their use despite some of these concerns. So lead pipes continue to be used and lead uh, solder, et cetera. Uh, and only in 1986, finally, was there a ban throughout the country to not use lead pipes anymore. But of course, the problem is 
lots of houses already had lead pipes installed. And some of those houses are maybe 100 years old, back when lead pipes are very common. So a lot of houses might have uh, lead pipes uh, that connect their house to the water main uh, on the street. So even if the water main is not made of lead, a lot of the houses would be, a lot of the older houses that uh, haven't upgraded, either because they didn't know or, or because they didn't have the financial ability to upgrade. So that's kind of the history of the lead pipes and why a lot of our houses in old cities uh, often will have lead pipes uh, as part of their piping system.